Let me share with you just a little bit this morning. We're going to be talking about uh, living a life of service. We're going to be continuing this series of messages we've entitled this month, Learning to Live Again. A uh, story about uh, George Mueller. You may, you may remember uh, a little bit hearing about him. He grew up in Prus- Pres- Prussia, excuse me, and uh, he himself admitted that he lived a life of sin and crime even while he was studying for the ministry of the state church. And it was at a home Bible study where he said that he actually received the Lord uh, as they were going through a little home prayer meeting time. And he was truly then convicted that the Lord was uh, convicting his heart and he needed to give his life to Jesus Christ. And that's the way it happens sometimes. We can spend a lot of time playing church. We can spend a lot of time pretending we want to lead. But sometimes even those who are wanting to lead the church or those who are going to church have never given their life to Christ. And Mueller was just such a person. And so uh, he gives his life to Christ, and then he moves to England. He sought acceptance there uh, uh, by the London Missionary Society, and and he wanted to be a missionary over to the Orient, but uh, he was rejected. And so he spent his time uh, while he was there uh, preaching anywhere the Lord would open a door and ministering to people. Uh, He then was led to Bristol, where in 1834 he founded a scriptural knowledge institution for home and abroad. And uh, a year later, he opened his first orphan home for 26 young ladies and had no financial assistance from anyone. By 1870, he had built five orphan homes, and, and, and uh, by prayer and faith in God, he was feeding 2,100 orphans daily. Uh, now, did, remember now, this is back in the 1800s, uh, mid-1800 time. Uh, uh, on, on, he, was, uh, he only allowed born-again Christians to... Uh, to serve in the institutions and help with the, uh, you know, t- caring of the young orphan children. And uh, their care for the children were both spiritual as material. And uh, many of the children were one to Christ over the years that they were there. Uh, the Scriptural Knowledge Institution also was instrumental in sending missionaries and Bibles and gospel literature around the world. Uh, the various schools operated by the institution enrolled over 121,000 Students with thousands of them receiving uh, Christ while they were in these institutions. And they distributed almost 300,000 Bibles in many different languages. Uh, In addition to one and a half million New Testaments, there were 163 missionaries that ended up being sent out and and, and or supported uh, through the institution. And over 111 million tracts were distributed, uh, gospel tracts that were in all different languages. And uh, in all, in uh, response to Mueller's prayers, uh, over seven and a half million, now put that in perspective, seven and a half million dollars was raised in the 1800s for this institution and in training of these people and these young orphan children. And, uh, and, and so uh, they were able to do a lot of work. Uh, Mueller read the Bible, it says, through over 200 times. Half of that was on his knees where he, con- he claimed a promise, open wide thy mouth and I will fill it. And so he read the Bible 200 times. I hope I could say that before I die, but, you know, it's going to be left between me and God to really be able to make that testament. Uh, really will. And uh, he spent the last 17 years of his life touring the world, telling of the blessings of the life and faith. And then uh, he died at age 93. Uh, leaving an estate valued at less than $1,000. Uh, he had given back to the institution over half a million dollars of personal gifts he had received over the 70 years that he ministered to them. And so he, he, he felt like that everything belonged to the Lord. And he, he made sure it all went back. Now, I'm sure that you're probably sitting this morning thinking George Mueller's story is just extraordinary. Uh, I'll never add up to a George Mueller or anyone like that, uh, Billy Graham or Bob Russell or uh, you just name it. Uh, but, but let me tell you something. Uh, God can use some ordinary people. Remember, this was a sinful man. He was tied up in crime. He was, he was actually stealing from people uh, while he was training to be in the ministry. And, and yet God changed him, and, and he began to move in his life in a way that he felt like he could do nothing but serve God. And so that's where we want to be at this morning. And in Romans chapter 12, we find the principle behind all of this. Uh, uh, it says, therefore, friends, uh, 
in, in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2 in the New American Standard. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, excuse me, a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And so this morning, as we continue this series of messages on uh, learning to live again, I want us to understand what it means to live a life of service, live a life of service. First of all, we have to see that there's going to be some sacrifices that need to be made, and we're going to look at four. First of all, there is a permanent sacrifice. It says, you notice how it, the word says present, present it says. Now, when we think about this, uh, we're to offer or present this sacrifice to God, and it's something that's going to be ongoing. And you could probably look back. This word presents the same one that's back in the Old Testament when you see the priest going in. And they're getting ready to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. Uh, that's the same word that's being used there. And these priests would come in. they bring a live animal in like a, a lamb or an ox or, or, or a goat or something like that. And they would just take this sharp knife and then they would offer that animal. And they would spill their blood and they would collect it. And they would even offer that to God. And they were making these sacrifices, but these were actually dead sacrifices. These animals didn't choose to die for God. And, and, and you know, maybe you're asking, so what did they do with them? Well, they would take the meat after they made their sacrifice to God, and they would uh, offer up that blood or, or that meat part portion of that sacrifice, and they would cook it and barbecue it, eat it, whatever they needed to do with it. Sometimes it would be certain portions of it had to be completely burned. But for the most part, this is a type of sacrifice. It was an ongoing thing. It was something that had to be done. Uh, it was, and, uh, and so when we make a commitment to Jesus as our Lord and Savior, uh, it's got to be an eternal sacrifice. It's something God says, you know what? I was not pleased with the blood of bull and goats, the Bible says. And so he made the atoning sacrifice in Jesus Christ himself. That's the only sacrifice that was pleasing to him. That's the only sacrifice that would be eternal for God, that would cover man's sin. And so God says, I desire the same type of sacrifice from you. I want a complete commitment from you that would be eternally uh, uh, in, you know, committed to me. In Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, he says, Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. And so notice the call to cross-carrying uh, was not a one-time event. Uh, you couldn't go in there and one time say, well, today, God, I'm going to give my life for you, but I can't say I'm going to do it tomorrow. Uh, he says, no, daily pick up your cross and follow me. Daily make your commitment for me. And so when we present ourselves for service, it's expected to be a permanent sacrifice. Secondly, there's a personal sacrifice. It says your, the word is your there, you know. I heard of a family who visited a church, and, and uh, as they were leaving the church parking lot, the dad says, uh, you know, that was the worst sermon I think I've ever heard. It was too long, it was boring, it was dry, the man just couldn't talk, I, I, I hated it. His wife sitting on the passenger side was leaving the car, said, and the music there, it was just awful. You know, the choir was off key. The music was, was all wrong. The slong, songs were too slow. Uh, I, I just couldn't stand it. And, and then the teenage girl sitting in the back says, yeah, she said, and the people just seemed like they had no life in them whatsoever, and there was no people there my age. And, and, you, know, and, and you know, they weren't very friendly. And then uh, the little boy that was there with them, noticing his dad when the offering plate come by, he said, well, Dad, you have to admit, it was a pretty good show for a quarter, you know, when he put his offering in. Uh, you know, <laughs> but God calls us to a, a personal sacrifice. And sometimes we spend more time probably complaining uh, about the level or quality of other Christians' sacrifice than we do examining and living out our own sacrifice. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that how terrible Christians can be sometimes? That's the ugly part about you know, I preached a sermon not too long ago talking about Christians can be critical. And, and, and that's, that's, that's so true sometimes. We spend more time complaining about, you know, the 
the preacher, if he didn't have that stammer or, or that if the choir, if they didn't sing so off key or if this person weren't so loud or if the piano was more in tune or if the organ played better or if this person, when they sang their special, didn't have the music so loud or the microphone was turned down. Or, you know, we spent so much time doing that kind of stuff. But if we could just say, God, we just honor you with the sacrifice that's been given today for everyone that was here and participated. You see, my job is not to come in and tell you what your fault is and your sacrifice to God. You know, I, I can't tell you whether you are a true servant of God or not. I, I, I can't tell you whether you've given enough or done enough or been involved enough. My job when I come to give a personal sacrifice to God is to ask God what he wants me to do for his kingdom. And so is your job. Now, I'm here as a preacher to challenge you to always do the best that you can do for his kingdom. But it's not my job to be the guardian, so to speak, or the gatekeeper of every Christian soul as to whether you're offering your life to God. Because, you know, when I can see you, when I'm standing here before you on Sunday morning and I can look at you and you're doing on your religious airs and you're doing your religious practice, and I say, well, God, I guess they're where they need to be today. And I'm judging you according to your church attendance or, or whatever the case may be or whether you decided to sing along when we offered up a, a, a worship song to God or whether you attended Sunday school. That's where I see you. But where does God see you? When you walk out of this door and then when you get in your car and you drive home and you run up behind the person behind you because they're running 35 and you're ready to go 55 and the K&W is already backing up at the door and you can see yourself standing out there in that rain and you're like, will you please burr, 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 go ahead, get out of the way. You see, God sees all that. And God and the Holy Spirit are the gatekeeper of your heart. and He knows what sacrifices you need to make to him. And the Bible says that you are to make a personal sacrifice. In John chapter 15, verse 16 says, Jesus tells us, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. How about that? And so the question we all need to ask ourselves is this, what am I personally doing to produce fruit for the kingdom of God? A better question may be to ask ourselves, what sacrifice am I making? In other words, if we were to remove you right now from the scene, if we were to take you out of here and not put you back into place, would there be a noticeable void in the kingdom because you are not here? And if you can say, they would never know I was gone, shame on you. Because the Bible says what? It's your sacrifice. And your, shackle, your sacrifice should make an impact on the lives of the people around you that are involved in the kingdom of God. And so if we could remove you and say, well, you know what, we don't even miss them. There was never really a sacrifice to begin with. You're not fully giving yourself to God. That brings us to the third point. This should be a there's a, personal, a permanent sacrifice, a personal sacrifice, and then there's a physical sacrifice. It says, the word here is bodies. Present your bodies. It seems interesting to me that the emphasis is not on our minds or our emotions or our spirit, but it's upon our physical body. And he says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. And where every area of our life should be sacrificed to God, uh, if our spirit is in tune with who God is and, and we're giving God what belongs to him and we're trying to honor God uh, with our spirit and offer up our spiritual sacrifices, and then we say, God, I want to give a personal sacrifice uh, and, and, and I'm emotionally tied to you. I'm intimately in love with you, God, and I want to give you everything that I have. And my emotions are tied in there and I've got my mind focused on the things of God. Well, guess what's going to happen? My body's going to follow suit. I'm going to do whatever it takes to honor God with my body. But sometimes we don't do that. And the Bible warns us about the things that we do with the body and how they pull us away from God and they deter us. And then the Bible goes on to warn us about the things that won't enter the kingdom of heaven, such as sexual immorality and debauchery and drunkenness and you name it. 
all things that the flesh can pull us down into. So our body must be also in tune with sacrificing for God so that we don't fall into uh, the lust of the flesh and we don't fall into the temptations of turning on the computer and allowing our eyes to infiltrate uh, into our minds and our hearts about the lustful things that can pop up on those screens. And we don't go out and we don't pick up whatever at the local liquor store and, and begin to introduce that into our body so that our mind becomes clouded and we don't so, we're not sober in our thinking because as we do that, we begin to pull further and further and further away from God. And God challenges us to make this physical sacrifice as well as we read this passage this morning. And so we're not only called to the right thinking and thinking about the right things or feeling the right things, we're called to use our bodies to accomplish the right things for God. And it's one thing to talk the talk, but it's quite another thing to walk the walk, isn't it? Oh, it's so tough. It's so tough sometimes when you say, oh, brother, I, I, I see your pain and I feel how, how, you know, how, you know, how deeply you are hurt by the loss of your job or I see how much struggle you're having in your marriage and, and, and you just need somebody to talk to. And I hope you, and in our mind we say, I hope you'll go talk to the preacher or I, or I see where they're in a, in a tight, you know, financially where he's or she's lost their job and, and I hope they get some help and we send them down to the social services or we, we don't really ever offer our physical bodies up to go and buy some groceries or go to the local church and, our, and, and go in our food pantry and say, you know what, uh, we see you're in need. And we want to give you whatever it is that we can to help you along. We don't want to get that personally involved. But the Bible says that we have to offer our bodies as a sacrifice. The scripture gives us both the positive and the negative uses for our bodies that we need to take under consideration. And in Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 14, it says, Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. And you can give up on so much of that stuff that gets in your life sometimes, the temptations that you're there. You, you know what? Uh, as I told you before, temptation is not going to be sin. The sin comes when you yield to temptation. And, and so you've got to say, I'm not going to yield, God. I'm going to honor you. Yes, there may be something that I'm tempted if you were an alcoholic and you're recovering from that or you're someone that would be bent toward that. You say, I'm not going to give in to taking another drink. If you're addicted to Internet pornography and you say, I, I, you know what, I, I, if I have to, I'm going to unplug the computer, but I'm not going to give in to clicking on that channel or that, that website. And if you are a person who has been involved in a physical abusive relationship, you say, you know what, though my flesh is bent toward anger, I'm not going to yield to striking my spouse again or my children. You make those decisions, and God honors you. Because the Bible says what? You belong to God. And it's by his grace that he saves you. And he gives you the power that you need in the Holy Spirit to overcome the things that tempt you in life. And then fourthly this morning, where there is a practical sacrifice, the words are living and holy. This language reminds us again of, of the sacrifices in the Old Testament period. But there's a big difference here. Those sacrifices were quite dead. But what does the word say? Living. Holy. That means it's something that you make a choice in. And as I said before, as a living sacrifice, we make the choice to get on the altar, but we also can make the choice to crawl off God's altar. That's the big difference. When the priest in the Old Testament drug in a goat or a bull or, or whatever it was that he offered up or an ox, what he would do was he would go in and when that thing tried to pull back from whatever it was, he just drove that sharp spear into him or that knife and he slayed him right there and drained his lifeblood. But in this, the imagery is here, you're making the sacrifice. 
you're taking yourself right to the altar of God. You're saying, God, I'm stretching myself out before you right here. Whatever it is you want to do with me, you take it. You see, now maybe God's saying, well, you know what I want from you. I want you to be wholly committed to me. And he's calling you to some type of sacrifice. He may be saying, you know what? You'd make a good missionary. Won't you give your life to me and follow me and be a missionary? Maybe he's saying, you know what? You'd make a good, good Sunday school teacher. Or you'd make a good person to work with the youth in your local church. Or you'd make a good person to have it up your benevolence. Uh, you'd make a good person to serve me in door-to-door outreach and whatever God is. And you go, wait a minute. Now, God, that really ain't what I was talking about. And I remember being stretched out before God one night before I ever left to go into ministry. And I was weighted down by so much pressure and stress and the job that I had. And, God, how can I honor you in my work and honor you in my family and honor you in my commitment that I have is serving as a deacon in my local church and God how can I do all that I've got so much waiting down on me and I can't because of some of the things that I'm required to do in my job I can't be involved in my church or I can't do the things that I need to do in my job because I committed to you in my church and and some of the things they've asked me to do that wouldn't honor you and so I'm torn and God how can I be a, a great father and a husband and be a man that would lead my family when I've got such all this stress bearing down on me and I never would give it all to him. And one night for about an hour in tears, I just sat there and laid it all out before God. And I said, God, finally, I got myself on the altar. And I presented myself as a living sacrifice before God. And I said, God, whatever it is, it's in my way from serving you and honoring you. I want you to have it. This was on a Tuesday and on a Friday, I had been taken out of my position at work. After serving nearly 11 years for a company, I thought I'd live, grow my retirement there. And God says, you finally gave it to me. And so I'm taking it away. God will never take anything away from you that you're not willing to surrender to him because he gives you the greatest gift he could ever give anyone, and that's free will. And so you have to decide whether you are going to offer that sacrifice that is both living and holy to him. And when you do it, expect God to respond in a way that will just blow your mind. I am amazed that he lets me stand before you every Sunday and preach the gospel message of Jesus Christ. I would have told you, as I've told you before, you could have probably heard every coin in my pocket and every key and everything else rattle just a handful of years ago. You couldn't have understood a word I said as I was telling folks last night. I sound like Boomhauer or whatever that guy's name is on that cartoon show. Hey, man, what do you want? I've been over there the other day, and I was just wondering, yeah, man, I just want yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the way I sounded when I talked. And you might still think I sound that way. But I sound nothing like I used to. And it's all because I was willing to be a living sacrifice for God. Now, what is it you need to sacrifice for the Lord this morning? Hebrews chapter 11, uh, 13, verses 15 through 16 says, Therefore, Jesus, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of the lips that confesses his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Maybe that's what I need. I have been sacrificing my, my praises to God for all he's done in my life. I, I realize that I could be doing more good for people around me, and I can reach out more. God will be pleased in that. Until we are willing to sacrifice, we cannot know what God wants to do for us. We can't really call ourselves servants of God Almighty. And so we have to ask ourselves, what what will I do? What what can we do and where can we go when God's calling us? What can we do uh, no matter what the risk might be uh, with it to our own lives? What will we be willing to do for God's kingdom? 
You see, once we're willing and we act upon our willingness, God's going to show up and he's going to honor his end of the deal. And so our passage once again says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is. Notice that? You're going to be able to prove what the will of God is when you come to this point in your life. And that which is good and acceptable and perfect. God's will in his life will show up for you when you turn your life over to him as you should. You can't go around and blame God for every little thing that goes wrong in your life and then say, well, if God loved me, he wouldn't allow this to happen to me. Well, if, well I don't know why God lets this go on in my life. I, I go to church every week and I write a check when I leave and I leave it in the offering plate. And, you know, I even go on Sunday night sometime. And once in a great while, I'll show up for Sunday school. And, 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 and I don't know why all this is going on in my life. Because you've really not given yourself. You haven't presented your body as a living and holy sacrifice before the Lord God. And until you do that, you'll never fully know what God's will is in your life. But let me tell you something. God's will for you is to live with you and to love you and to care for you like no one else would ever do it. And it all begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so let me ask you this morning, have you surrendered your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior? And if you haven't, what stops you from that? And you're struggling with all kinds of stuff in your life. Your life is completely different from mine, maybe. But I've got problems in my life from time to time, and if I don't give them to God, they just mount up and mount up and mount up and mount up. And maybe yours is to the point now that they're over your head, and you're like, I just don't know where to turn. Well, once things get over your head, what do you have to look? You can't look forward because there's stuff in front of you. You have to look up. And God always leaves that opening there for you to look up to him. And so you see Christ standing there and giving your life to him and just watch that stuff begin to melt away. It is amazing how God works and opens doors and possibilities in your life. And just because what? You were willing to offer yourself as a living sacrifice before him. It begins with a commitment to Christ. 